Hello, good morning, good day, and good evening uh, to our global audience, uh, as well as our local audience. Uh, it's my role and my pleasure today to welcome uh, all of you to this joint seminar uh, of the Graduate Institute and CEPR. This is not the first um, and hopefully not the last time that we are uh, conducting this kind of uh, collaboration uh, between the two institutions. And uh, what we try to do is to bring you uh, really flagship uh, events. Uh, in this case here, it's a flagship report presentation. We have a fantastic lineup of people who will be presenting and discussing. And uh, I am now very happy to hand over uh, the moderation uh, to Ugo Banitza, who is uh, also has the double hat of vice president of CEPR and my colleague at the Granite Institute. Ugo, yours. Thank you very much, Beatrice. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. So this is a joint cooperation between uh, CPR and the Graduate Institute, specifically the, the Center for Finance and Development uh, at the Graduate Institute. Um, so what we are going to uh, do today, so we, we have this presentation uh, of one of the uh, flagship reports of, uh, of the World Bank, uh, the, the Global Economic Prospects, which, uh, which will focus on the recovery. And uh, we are lucky to have uh, two of the main authors of the report, Hayan Koza and Francisca Honsorge, who will make a presentation of about uh, 30 minutes. And then we will have a, a discussion by uh, Jeremy Lawson, who is uh, the chief economist of uh, Aberdeen Standard Research Institute, and uh, Nathan Sussman, who is uh, a professor at the Graduate Institute and is the uh, director of the Center uh, for Finance and Development uh, at the Institute. And then after that, we will have time uh, for, for questions uh, with the others, authors. Uh, for questions, please use the uh, Q&A uh, tab that uh, that you have. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, pass the, the microphone to, I guess, Ayan, you're starting. Thank you, uh, Ugo. And thank you, Beatrice, and thank you, colleagues at CPR, for giving us this opportunity to uh, tell the kind of the views of the bank about the global uh, economic outlook. Uh, I'm very pleased. Uh, to, to join the uh, panel today with my colleagues, uh, Francisca Ostronge, manager of the Prospects Group. And uh, I'm very pleased, of course, to see uh, Nathan and, and Jeremy joining us today. I look forward to uh, the exchange. Uh, let me uh, briefly uh, talk about the, the, the report, what we have and, and what we try to do uh, basically in this edition. So the report uh, was released uh, the, the, uh, early 2021, in the first week of 2021. Uh, and the, uh, it has this uh, usual uh, global and regional outlook sections. In addition, uh, it has uh, multiple analytical pieces. One piece uh, focuses on the debt problem uh, that was there prior to the pandemic, uh, it has now become even more important. The second piece uh, focuses on what type of growth we are expecting during the 2020s. In, uh, of course, 2010s, we experienced a period of disappointments when we think about the growth forecast performance uh, of advanced economies, emerging market developing economies. The question is whether after this uh, pandemic, uh, we are heading into a decade of growth disappointments. And the third question is somewhat uh, very important, especially now for emerging market economies, the consequences of asset purchase programs of a number of uh, emerging market central banks. Today, we structure the presentation around three questions. The first question is, what are near-term growth prospects? For 2021, we are 
cautiously optimistic. Growth will come back, but still it will be a subdued recovery this year and beyond. We still think that risks are tilted to the downside. The second question, uh, how has the pandemic worsened growth prospects for 2020s? We are expecting more pronounced potential growth slowdown over the 2020s. There was a potential growth slowdown underway prior to the pandemic because of the adverse impact of the pandemic on physical investment, human capital investment, and, and of course, the, the confidence and, and how uh, businesses, some of the businesses have to adjust. We are thinking that we will see weakening potential growth prospects in the new decade. And when you think about 2010s, we also saw repeated downgrades in long-term growth projections. In all likelihood, these types of downgrades will continue accompanied with a slowdown in potential growth. So the third question is, what to do against this background? What can policymakers do? In the short term, the answer is very simple. They need to address the health crisis at hand. And that starts with rapid and broad-based distribution of vaccine and, and getting the vaccines to the largest segments of global population as fast as possible. Policymakers need to continue to provide relief for vulnerable populations, keep viable firms afloat, and of course, do everything possible to ease that burdens during this transition. When they think about withdrawing support measures, they have to be extremely careful not to adversely affect the recovery. Undertaking reforms to recharge growth, but not just growth, sustainable and equitable growth in light of the impact of the pandemic on poverty and inequality is going to be critical. Ultimately, there are very serious global challenges, including uh, climate change, including those challenges related to trade and financial flows, taxation. All of these challenges will require global community working together. So throughout this presentation, we are going to use this acronym, EMDs, Emerging Market Developing Economies. Let me stop here. Uh, Francisca is going to provide uh, the details and how we answer these questions. Francisca, uh, the floor is yours. You are muted. Okay, needs a double click. Thank you. So let's start with the short term outlook. We, we've all seen the sharp resurgence of the pandemic. We've seen it, we felt it in the past three months. And that was six months ago when we did the previous edition, that was something we had not expected. We had not Thought, we thought that this second or third or nth wave was a, a downside risk. It was not what's going, what's going to happen. So as a result of this resurgence of the virus, all these lockdown measures that had just been eased over the summer have now been reimposed and reimposed in many of the world's largest economies. Now, of course, the vaccine related news have been very good, but until the pandemic is really brought under control, it's very difficult to see a robust recovery. And what the pandemic has, and these lockdowns that have been associated with this and social distancing has caused is something that resembles very much a two speed recovery in the global economy from, from really the depth of the recession sometime in April, March, April. Everything related to goods production has rebounded and has actually rebounded faster than after the global financial crisis. There's manufacturing, industrial production, goods trades, metals prices. So for example, on the left here, you can see that by September already, global goods trade had essentially returned to pre-pandemic levels. And that's after a collapse of 15% in March and April. So it's much faster than after the global financial crisis. Or take metals prices that we treat as a, as a bellwether of global industrial activity. 
they're now more than 20% above pre-pandemic levels. You can see that here in the chart on the right. So everything related to goods has rebounded. Everything that has been related to these, affected by these lockdowns has floundered and remains weaker, in some cases weaker than after the global financial crisis at a similar point. So services trade here, for example, in the chart on the left, despite a recovery in the sum, summer, is still more than 10% 10, 10 below pre-pandemic levels. Or oil prices here in the chart on the right, despite these historic, absolutely historic OPEC production cuts, are still well below their pre-pandemic levels. And remember that oil, two thirds of oil demand is for travel and transport. So of course that has been hard hit by the lockdowns. So this recovery that we've seen in the, since the summer, since, so for the last half year or nine months, or eight, eight months, is likely to continue. So that we will see something that looks like a rebound in 2021. The question is how strong will it be? And we've modeled explicitly here three scenarios. Of course, a baseline scenario, but also a downside and an upside scenario that depend on the path of the pandemic. We did that with the Oxford economics model that we augmented with an, epidemiolo with an SIR model, an epidemiological model. And that the baseline assumption is that sometimes by the middle of this year, the social distance, the pandemic has been reined in to such an extent that some of these social distancing measures can really be, be unwound, at least in the major advanced economies and the major, uh, and the major uh, emerging markets and developing economies. And then by the end of this year, the majority of the population in advanced economies and large EMDs will be vaccinated. So with that kind of baseline scenario, we expect something like 4% growth in 2021. That is well above potential, global potential growth, so the, the full employment kind of growth, which is more on the order of two and a half percent, but it's not enough to undo last year's losses, losses when the global economy contracted by 4.3%. In advanced economies, that would be even more pronounced. So you would see that, three, that rebound to 3.3%, which is nowhere near enough to offset the more than 5% contraction of last year. Now in EMDEs, last year was special. Last year had for the first time in our data series since 1970, there had been a, a contraction in EMDE growth of two and a half percent. This year there will be a strong rebound, but that is driven by China. This is the rebound in China. Without China, this year's growth will be more in EMDEs will be more on the order of three and a half percent. And again, nowhere near enough to offset the more than five percent contraction last year. Now, of course, things could be better, and that's one. Of, that's our upside scenario where the pandemic is reined in a quarter earlier. And in that event, you could have 5% global growth this year, and that would be enough to at least return to our 2019 output levels. But an alternative scenario is that it takes longer to bring the pandemic under control. And what we modeled explicitly was that it takes two quarters longer. And then we would not be able to recover even next year to our 2019 output levels. Global growth, instead of being 4%, would be on the order of 1.5% this year. And it will take another year to even just undo the damage of 2020, let alone the, the years of foregone growth. So for a lot of emerging markets and developing economies, the outlook has actually deteriorated over the last six months. You can see that here in the chart of the, on the right, the red bars, it shows you the share of countries where we've, all our countries, all our feet on the ground, have had to revise down their forecasts for 2021. It's two thirds of emerging markets and developing economies. And the same is true for 90% of advanced economies. And that's mainly a reflection of the pandemic, that second wave that was not in our baseline six months ago, second wave, end wave. Now the risks to this global outlook are tilted to the downside, even though the outlook is already subdued. And some of the risks pertain to weaker short-term growth, a weaker recovery, rebound, and some would cause a, are about causing a, a decade of lost growth, essentially. So I won't read you here the list of, um, of risks. You can read them. But I want to point out to you what has changed. So six months of, ago, we, had, we were worried about a vaccine being discovered. Now we know. But uh, there's still sizable risks about the vaccine delivery. And in the short term, because of, of that resurgence of infections, there's also a sizable risk 
that that recovery will be held back simply because the pandemic cannot be brought under control while the vaccines are being rolled out. On the other hand, in June, we still were worried about risks of trade tensions and another commodity price plunge. Those have receded a bit now. Clearly, financial risks, the risks of a financial crisis, remain very high and, if anything, have intensified since the pandemic. Take uh, that, that, that is a whole section that we dedicated to debt. So take government debt, for example. Uh, in government debt alone, without even taking into account private debt, has increased by 16 percentage points of GDP in 2020 to a record 99% of GDP globally. And advanced economies up by 20 percentage points of GDP and EMD is by 9 percentage points of GDP. Those are large increases. For EMDEs, that is the single largest one-year increase since 1987, when a whole number of them were in debt crisis. And for advanced economies, you have to go back before our data starts, so before 1970, to find this kind of one-year increase in government debt. Now, for private debt, we don't have sufficient data, up-to-date data to do a similar calculation. But the, our presumption is that it has also surged. That was, after all, the whole point of a good chunk of the fiscal stimulus, about half of the G20 fiscal stimulus, was to support loans, credit guarantees, that kind of thing. And it, it, it was also, it, the monetary policy stimulus has also helped. So the whole point of the stimulus was to prevent a massive private sector deleveraging. Now, if it was just about 2020, one might not be so concerned. But that 2020 debt surge comes on top of a record high increase in total debt since 2010. In our earlier work, we've documented four waves of global debt since 1970. And that most recent global wave of debt, the fourth one, started in 2010, and even before the pandemic, was the fastest, largest, and most broad-based increase in debt. And this debt, this fourth wave, has now been supercharged by the pandemic. So the red bars here in the, red, in the chart on the right show you the speed, the average annual increase in debt accumulation in this fourth wave of debt compared to the previous ones. You see that it's been faster than any of the previous waves of debt, especially in emerging markets and developing economies, even, though, even once you exclude China. Now, there are clearly risks to government debt from to, to, risk to of fin government financial debt crisis, simply because debt stocks are so high and make governments vulnerable. But this increase, this increase of debt in government debt was, of course, the result of fiscal stimulus as well as the output contraction. But we've also seen unprecedented monetary policy stimulus that raises its own issues and concerns, both about government debt as well as perhaps private debt. 18 EMDE central banks have announced asset purchases often for the very first time. And you can see here in the chart on the left, these purchases were typically much smaller than in advanced economies, but they were also less transparent. These purchases also had a different purpose from similar programs in advanced economies. In advanced economies, they were typically targeted at monetary stimulus when interest rates were at the zero lower bound. In emerging markets, they were typically implemented to stabilize financial markets, sometime in March, April last year. Now, what we tested is, have these purchases achieved their goals? This goal of stabilizing financial markets. That's what we try to address here in this chart in the middle. By our estimates, yes, they have. They appear to have stabilized financial markets. So in a very standard event study, we estimate that five days after these announcements of asset purchases in these 18 EMDEs, government bond yields were statistically significantly lower by 35 basis points. Now, 35 basis points, the context for that is that government bond yields at, at that time of stress in March, April had just risen by about 100 basis points. So yes, these measures announcement appear to have helped stabilize government bond markets. Equity prices were also up. The other interesting thing that we found here is the thing that we did not actually find. <laughs> when uh, emerging markets conduct this monetary policy stimulus, there's always a, a concern that you get depreciation, but actually, that's there for that we find no systematic evidence. It does not have to appear to have been a statistically significant depreciation in these countries. Now, that does not, the second question you can ask is 
will these policies be effective again next time they're used? And that's where our concerns are. These policies were implemented under very exceptional circumstances at a time when all the major emerging markets were also implementing extraordinarily accommodative policies. And there were surprise announcements, departures from years of central banks uh, building credibility. So the second time, there won't be a surprise, and there may not be that kind of global accommodative environment. But the third concern is one that is specific to EMDEs with weak policy frameworks and weak institutions. Our concern is that if these policies continue to be implemented in these countries, over time, they may come to resemble past episodes of central banks financing fiscal deficits. And we look at five case studies of these debt monetization episodes in the 80s and the 90s, and all of them were associated with uh, macroeconomic stability. And we all know that the crisis that happened at the time. Now, for now, the emerging markets that have announced asset purchase look very different from those case studies of debt monetization in the 80s and 90s. Inflation is lower, inflation expectations are better anchored, and of course, monetary and fiscal uh, frameworks are much stronger. And until the pandemic, fiscal positions were also much better. But that last point, that is no longer so clear now. With the pandemic, very big fiscal deficits have opened up. I mean, on average, in EMDs, double digits, but in these particular 18 EMDs, just below double digit fiscal deficits. And even if there is the expected uh, fiscal consolidation this year, the fiscal deficits in these 18 EMDs now begin to approach what happened in past cases of debt monetization. So in those countries that don't have strong policy frameworks, the concern can develop that there may be pressure on central banks to either fund governance, governments or to at least ease government financing conditions. Now, one of the reasons for the severe output losses caused by the pandemic was the collapse in investment, as you can see here. Uh, investment in emerging markets other than EMDEs collapsed by 11%. You can see that here. That is almost twice as much as during the global financial crisis. And again, if it was just 2020, maybe the concerns would not be so big. But this comes after a decade, a decade of slowing weak EMDE investment growth. Now, of course, for 2021, 22, as the recovery gets underway, we expect more investment. But that recovery in investment is likely to be muted by our expectations. Even in 2022, investment will still be 2% below its 2019 levels, simply because of the disruptions brought by the pandemic and the uncertainty caused by what will be the, the post-pandemic landscape. So this was the near-term outlook. But the challenges go far beyond the near term. They, they extend into the next decade. Already over the past decade, all fundamental drivers of growth have been slowing. Investment growth, productivity growth, improvements in education and health, working age population growth. And this has been well documented. We've documented this in our, two of our previous uh, publications as well. And there was no reason to expect that these trends would reverse in the 2020s. So here for the chart, or actually for both these charts, we have modeled a very standard Cobb-Douglas Cop function type potential growth. Uh, so the long-term full employment type of growth. And even before the pandemic, we expected that potential growth over the, would slow between the 2010s and the 2020s by 0.4 percentage point globally, the difference between the orange line and the blue bar, and by about one percentage point in EMDEs. That's just the, the weakening in the fundamental, fundamental drivers of growth that was underway anyways. Now, as a result of these disruptions caused by the pandemic, you just saw the, the investment collapse. And there was also an education, a large scale education uh, disruption. This slowdown in potential growth that was anyways in the works is likely to be steeper. So now we expect it to be another 0.3 percentage points steeper globally and another 0.6 percentage points steeper in EMDEs. And that slowdown will cut across EMDE regions. And it would not be a surprise. Such a decline in growth prospects over the subsequent decade, decade is exactly what happens after recessions. 
global recessions as well as country specific recessions. So here we look at this with a different angle. Here we use uh, for, as our measure of long-term growth prospects, not potential growth based on this model, but expectations, 10 year ahead consensus growth forecasts. And we do this because this is what determines today's investment and consumption decisions. This prospects for growth a decade ahead. So take, for example, the global financial crisis, the last global recession here. Over the decade from 2010 to 2019, long-term growth forecasts for emerging markets and developing economies were lowered by more than two point, well, more than two percentage points. And for advanced economies by about half a percentage point. And that did not happen immediately, at least for EMDEs. That happened gradually because year after year after year, growth disappointed. And it took forecasters a while to realize it, they're just not going to go back to these pre-crisis growth, growth expectations, long-term growth prospects. Now, of course, global recessions are special. They're particularly severe, broad-based, they're particularly bad recessions. But we've also looked at country-specific recessions. We took all the country-specific recessions over the past 30 years in more than 55 countries and uh, estimate a local projections model to see what happens to long-term growth forecasts after these country-specific recessions. And even five years after these recessions, long-term growth forecasts, so 10-year ahead growth forecasts, are one and a half percentage point lower in countries with recessions than those without. You can see that here. And this was a statistically significant difference. The interesting thing is this was not statistically significantly different the first year after the recession. It takes a while again for this realization to sink in that growth prospects just are per that will not go back to where they were before the recession. Now, of course, it's possible that this time is different and the, the pandemic generates this big productivity boost. All we're saying here is, of course, it's not impossible. It just would be historically very unusual. So unless this productivity boost can be can ignite spontaneously, it will need to be engineered by policies. And as Ayana has already pointed out to you, what is needed is a whole package of policies, not just to tackle the crisis in the short term, but also to boost growth over the longer term. What we did in this, uh, so here's a list of policies. You recognize many of them. What we did in this particular edition of the report we conducted a thorough literature review of every study we could find that linked these policies to growth or to productivity growth in some country at some period of time. So all of these studies, I mean, all of these policies have been associated at some point in, in some of these studies to higher growth or higher productivity growth. And these policies really fall into two buckets. First, there are the near term urgent prior priorities that are really created by the pandemic and are probably priorities for almost every country in the world. Control the pandemic, support those suffering, vulnerable groups. But second, there's a, a bunch of policies that are needed and have become much more urgent now to return or to put long-term growth on a faster path. And that includes, for example, policies that just uh, smooth, grease the wheels of the recovery to smooth the recovery. So things that, that allow a faster reallocation of resources from companies that will not survive to companies that will thrive after the pandemic. And for a lot of emerging markets and developing economies, these policies include things like facilitating insolvency or startup regimes, just to allow to speed up the recovery. For emerging markets and developing economies, there are also a number of policies that are needed to boost private investment. You remember from the debt slide how small, how narrow fiscal space is in emerging markets and developing economies at this point. Many of them don't have the luxury of boosting public investment. So for them, it's back to basics. It's back to improving governance, improving business climates, easing, facilitating private investment. The good news is that these policies can pay off. And we want to show you this in two experiments. On the left here, we've taken, we've returned to our uh, potential growth framework and modeled a stretch reform scenario. What it is, so here in the blue bars, you see the decline in potential growth of more than one and a half percentage points between the 2010s and the 2020s that we expect now for emerging markets and developing economies. 
Now imagine a stretch reform scenario where every EMD improved its investment growth by as much as its best 10 year performance, improved its secondary education outcomes by as much as its best 10 year performance, and raised female labor force participations by that much that it can close the gap to, uh, to male participation by as much as the best quartile of performance. So by about a third. If every country did that, potential growth could be higher by almost a percentage point. It would be enough to reverse the damage of the pandemic and a bit more. So potential growth would still decline, but by much less than otherwise. Now this is sort of looking a decade ahead, but the benefits can happen even, for, even earlier. And that's what we try to capture in this exercise on the right. Here we looked at all the episodes where countries implemented institutional reforms and we picked deliberately institutional reforms. So improvements in ICRG indicators of investment profiles, bureaucratic quality, control of corruption, rule of law. And it turns out that, if, you know, according to our LPM estimates here, it turns out that five years after these episodes of institutional reforms, consensus forecasters significantly raise their long-term growth expectations for these countries by 0.8 percentage points. And conversely, they punish setbacks in these, uh, in these episodes. So when these institutional indicators deteriorate, consensus forecasts are, forecasts are significantly downgraded for the next decade. So just to, to summarize once again, the short-term outlook is for subdued recovery until the pandemic is really brought under control with, with uh, downside risks. Now, the concern is that the pandemic has, of course, worsened, deepened the potential growth slowdown that was anyways underway. So it'll need a big policy push to really bring growth back up to a level where it can boost prosperity as well, help achieve development goals. Allow me just one brief slide of advertising. There are many studies that deepen some of these themes, but one study in particular I want to point you to, this global productivity study that we just released in July. It has a chapter on what happens to labor productivity after bad events. So after recessions, financial crisis, as you saw here, but also after wars, climate disasters, other natural disasters like volcanoes erupting. And what it does not find after any of these adverse events is that productivity surged. What happens after these events is a statistically significant decline in labor productivity several years after. So that is our concern that we're heading into a very difficult de decade for growth. Thank you. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Francisca and Aya. Now we go to uh, first to Jeremy and then to, uh, to uh, Nathan. We will uh, give about uh, 10 minutes of discussion and then we'll open uh, for Q&A. We already have many questions. Uh, from the public. But when you were talking about productivity, I think if somebody were to do a study on the productivity of the JEP group, they would find a massive Ion and Francisca effect because it seems that the productivity of the group has increased uh, dramatically after the two of you joined it. So, but uh, let, let me go to uh, Jeremy. Okay, so, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, uh, the first point I wanted to make um, was actually just how much appreciated this particular type of outlook is. As, as I'm sure most people in the audience are aware, most global outlooks, including by most of the international organizations, have a very heavy tilt towards the advanced economies or the largest uh, emerging economies. And I think it's just great to have a publication, particularly one as detailed and as rigorous as this one is, that sort of shifts our gaze, right? It sort of forces our attention to be focused on the rest of the world where, you know, the, the bulk, bulk of the world's population sort of resides and, and then also where, um, where some of the greatest sort of long-term growth challenges are. So I think that's a real virtue. Uh, of, of this publication and this particular outlook. Now, having said that, um, I was sort of still very much struck by how pessimistic the outlook for global growth is as it's presented. 
in the paper. Now, I think we're all aware of just how difficult forecasting is in the current climate. Um, and again, I think the paper does a, a great job of sort of to trying to take into account um, in the outlook of the various sort of forces that can influence growth over both the near term and the long term. And I think this productivity study is, is especially valuable. However, the base case presented here, right, is around a percentage point weaker than the current global consensus, right? So it is significantly weaker than the consensus. In fact, the current global consensus is closer to the upside case for 2021 and 2022 that was just presented. And then the characterization that risks are then tilted to the downside of a central view that is already below that consensus. So I think to me really understates that the analysis of the World Bank here so it is providing some, you know, even though there's a recovery in a relative sense some quite negative signals. Now, so sort of trying to ascertain you know, where that is where that is coming from, um, I suspect, although I, I haven't had a chance to investigate this properly, and so perhaps we'll sort of this can be answered in the Q and A. Um, part of it might be related to what is being assumed uh, for policy. Um, so, as I'm sure a lot of the audience are aware. Um, the fiscal policy environment in the United States in particular is set to change enormously this year. Um, we're likely to get um, both a, another near-term support program that could very easily, particularly of the Democrats, sort of pursue um, a budget reconciliation process um, more than a, another trillion US dollars through that channel and, and perhaps up to two trillion. Um, so somewhere between five and 10% of US GDP of additional near-term support. Um, and then on top of that, uh, um, at the, by the end of the year, once we get into the new US fiscal year that begins in October, there is another likely large longer term stimulus program, net stimulus program, um, that will be very much focused on, on public investment primarily, but also investment in things like social infrastructure, early childhood education, these sorts of things. Now, we because partly because we reside in markets. And so, you know, a lot of our audience um, doesn't really permit us to say, well, we're not going to build this into our forecast until it's legislated. We have taken that into account in our central forecast. And it makes a really big difference for, for the United States in particular, but then there are also spillover benefits to the rest of the world. So for example, it's enough for us to see actually the US economy operating above its pre-COVID trend path by the middle of 2022, right? So that's a big shift. And so with China already operating above its pre-COVID trend path, the world's two largest economies are, I mean, it's not to say that they're in perfect long-term shape, right? Or that there won't, you know, not necessarily discounting the potential for productivity growth to slow over time. So for this sort of shift down to occur, um, but I think that that near-term outlook may be more positive than it appears. Now, trying to anticipate exactly what vaccine and viral trends are is, I mean, extremely difficult to do. And it's good to see the transparency of the assumptions that were made uh, in this particular outlook. Um, but again, I suspect that particularly because of the way that vaccinations in many countries are focused on vaccinating the most vulnerable, that what we might see is a larger degree of opening in some of the major advanced economies but also some select large emerging economies that might be a little bit faster than what is being factored sort of into the central case uh, here. Now again I don't absolutely agree that there are meaningful downside risks that we have to pay attention to. I mean the potential for vaccine escape uh, and getting into a more of a regular sort of a cycle where sort of COVID is sort of regularly and more persistently depressing growth is a real one that we have to pay attention to. But in terms of thinking about the base case and the distribution of risks around it, um, I would sort of be tilting that base case up. Um, certainly in our forecast, they're a little bit higher in the central view. Uh, and, and we would sort of see the distribution of risks as being a little bit more evenly balanced around that central case. So that's sort of the first sort of important point I wanted to make. The second important point that I wanted to make, and you know, this is a challenging one, is whether some of the concern in the paper 
about the increase in public sector debt in particular is, um, is excessive. Um, I, just as a bit of a background, um, I worked at the OECD through the financial crisis uh, and in the, in the two years afterwards um, before, before moving on. And when the global economy began to recover from the financial crisis, right, and there was sort of greater optimistic about what the long-term outlook might be, um, the OECD, as well as many other official institutions, very quickly turned to recommending austerity, to be fretting about the increase in public debt to GDP ratios that had been built up as a result of the financial crisis itself, the structural stimulus or the contingent sort of lending that had been put in place, in so many cases, the bailouts of the banking sector. And so the policy recommendations very quickly turned from how do we support the recovery to, oh my gosh, look at the debt, we need, we, we need a consolidation path. Now, governments may have pursued those objectives independently of what the international institutions recommended at the time. So I don't want to sort of suggest that those organizations um, bear the responsibility for what happened afterwards. But in hindsight, it is very clear that what happened in the post-crisis period was a major policy error right, where not only was on average monetary policy not as accommodative as it ought to have been, but fiscal policy and monetary policy were often at cross purposes and that the consolidation agendas that took place across many countries was excessive and it occurred too early and ultimately it harmed the recovery. Now, the extent to which you worry about debt, right, the buildup of public debt in particular, I think does depend very much on the context, right? So for example, how great is the risk that the structure of global interest rates should have shifts up, right? What is the potential for advanced economies? So in the United States in particular, to start to move into an environment where it's looking to tighten monetary policy with all of the consequences that would have for the rest of the world. Um, but also the context of what is happening in the private sector, because whilst it's absolutely true that public dissavings have increased substantially in, in most economies, well, it's also the case that actually private sector savings have increased um, as much and in some countries even more, right? So there are a number of emerging economies that sort of went from running current account deficits sort of before COVID to running sort of modest current account surpluses afterwards. So effectively the public sector disaving has been more than offset by private sector increases in saving. So I guess the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that where we have to be careful is that, is that if we, in a sense, misjudge the potential for the interest rate structure to increase. And my personal view and, and our analytical view, research-based view, is that the forces that have been weighing on nominal and real interest rates globally are likely to be sustained, then what we might not realise is that actually there's a lot more fiscal space than one might consider. Um, uh, and particularly, and again, as the author said, in those countries where, look, policy frameworks are, you know, if not perfect, but sort of are somewhat robust, um, and where the broader way that we would characterise imbalances, per particularly systemic imbalances, um, I don't think is especially stretched by historical standards. Uh, and so where, where I would say is that we don't think we've run out of sort of space for fiscal policy. In many cases, in many countries, both advanced and emerging, there actually ought to, I think, be more of it, particularly if it is focused on those things that enhance long-term growth, right? So again, if we think about it in the context of fiscal rules, right? Well, you know, you need to create space for public investment. I mean, the authors make the exceptional point that, that if, you, if you're in a persistently weak investment environment, right, then that sort of relates to, you know, to capital capital accumulation, long-term potential growth, but public investment, particularly around the energy transition, but just the general, the escape from the COVID crisis, um, that has got a really important role to play. And if public investment is well calibrated, well, actually it improves the net debt position in the long-term of the economy. It doesn't weaken it. Uh, and so we should be trying to encourage that in as many places as possible.
Um, another just couple of points before I sort of I, I move on, you know, for, for others. Um, so one is uh, also this sort of this question of well, how much will this crisis damage long term economic growth, right? So potential growth. And again, I thought some of the analysis here was was, was really interesting and, and and quite compelling. One question I had about the recession comparison was this sense of whether we're comparing apples with apples. Right, so there a lot was sort of made of what happened after the financial crisis, but, but the financial global financial crisis was a financial crisis, and there's very significant evidence that financial crises are associated with much worse long-term outcomes than regular recessions. On top of that, even non-financial crisis recessions in the past often relate to significant imbalances that exist in the global economy um, and individual countries where they're applied. But I think that most of us would agree that whilst the global economy wasn't imbalance free before the COVID crisis, um, it wasn't the cause of the recession itself. Um, and so I do wonder whether there is a greater potential to emerge from this particular crisis, not without there being some long-term damage done, but without as much long-term damage done, and particularly to the long-term potential growth rate, because whilst I think a levels effect is almost guaranteed, to go that step further and assume that it's also going to be weighing on potential growth, such that that levels gap almost sort of is widening over time, that is a stronger assumption and we need to interrogate the nature of this crisis and make sure that we're comfortable with that conclusion. Um, anyway, so I see we're already at sort of 12.47 sort of in the UK where I am and, and sort of make plenty of time for the Q&A and the next presentation. So I'll leave it there and I, I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much, Jeremy. So now we go to, to Nita Sussman for the next discussion. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, so I'm gonna, uh, and you see the PowerPoint to share, I managed to share the screen. Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'll, uh, so thank you for, uh, for the opportunity to comment on this, uh, on this report. Uh, I think that uh, um, the presentation made by uh, Ian and Francisca before made it uh, much clearer than uh, reading. I think they put the right emphases and, and part of the things I'm gonna say in my discussion are based on reading the report and, and, and therefore some of the issues were already addressed. Uh, so, uh, okay. So basically what I did, uh, because I was also discussing the previous report is compare the emphases made in both these reports. And I think when we were here in June, we were thinking about a health crisis with the relative uh, quick recovery of the sort that my, uh, the Jeremy uh, just discussed before, that this is a health crisis. There will not be severe imbalances, definitely not in the advanced economies that would uh, cause some long-term concerns. And uh, we were in June after a successful first lockdown, and we were thinking something of, uh, of a V. And, and, and so the report in June talked about sort of more short-term things, uh, emphasis on, on trade, exports, oil prices, et cetera. And now this uh, new report is, is partially clouded by this uh, pessimism uh, brought by the effect that we uh, basically did not contain the virus uh, as we thought we were in June. And so we're now, the report sort of uh, looks more at concerns that follow uh, standard recessions, not just health crises. And they're focusing on potential growth, on investment, debts, uh, the sort of things that uh, are usually associated with uh, recessions and, and, and crises, which are not necessarily health related. So I think in terms of the previous discussion that Jeremy had, uh, so I think initially we were all thinking about this health crisis with different uh, prospects. And now as time goes on, uh, we're starting to think that maybe this would resemble more uh, your standard, uh, or sort of more resemble more of a standard recession. So I think that's 
kind of where the focus shifts. And now we're thinking about these W's or even a U uh, sort of uh, recovery, uh, recession and recovery. It's not going to be as quick as we thought. And I think that's uh, pretty clear, I think, from the report. Uh, I'd like to pick up on, on one point, on two points, actually, in the discussion, in, in the report, in my discussion. And the first is this uh, some, some sort of dichotomy between economics and health policy. Uh, we, I think the report notes, and I think we can all see, that the economic ER, the emergency response, emergency room response of, of the economic factors was adequate. Central banks uh, engaged in very immediate uh, liquidity injection and, and sort of we prevented a, a, a major financial crisis or a liquidity crisis, governments, uh, increased deficits and contrary to the uh, austerity measures that were maybe uh, following the, the 2009 crisis. And uh, after initial success, as I said before, in the spring of 2020, uh, there's basically uh, an almost just a position to the success of economic response, there is a failure of the health crisis management. And I think this is not sufficiently highlighted in the report. And I think that the role of reports like the GAP uh, produced by the World Bank or anything the IMF would do is also to highlight the economic cost of failed health responses. Health is not, I mean, obviously I agree, it's first and foremost about saving lives. But even in the conclusion and recommendation slides that I saw just a minute before, uh, it was under saving lives. Okay, so we want to save lives, but also saving lives is not just for, it's, it's also related to saving the economy. And I think the, the, these sort of reports have to highlight the uh, economic cost of failed health responses. And some of these failed health responses uh, were taken because uh, the people taking the decisions had what I call partial equilibrium economic concerns. They said, oh, we cannot do a lockdown. We don't want to do all these measures that will uh, affect negatively affect economic outcomes. But in fact, what we see now is that we're getting into more severe lockdowns uh, with much greater economic costs. And I think that uh, we should, uh, in our analysis, uh, make health and, and, and economics kind of close together. So if we look at, at, for instance, things that CPR has done, and, and, I, and, and I laud uh, Beatrice and, and Charles Whiplash, who has uh, initiated the uh, COVID economics uh, series. So we're already now an issue uh, uh, that I just put the, on the slide, the most uh, recent issue 65 from last week. So you can see the articles there. Uh, optimal vaccine policy, school openings, all those kind of things that are connecting the health crisis to, to the economic. And there's a lot of economic analysis that goes on. Uh, so the CPR has done a lot in terms of uh, promoting these things. Uh, for our own part here in Switzerland, uh, we also urged the government uh, to go for a second lockdown in October. Uh, and, and, and now we're, we're already talking about continuing some sorts of confinements and lockdowns all the way to, February, to, to April because action was delayed. And that's the economist who uh, argued that for for also for economic reasons, uh, you should act uh, more forcefully in, in terms of uh, mitigating the, the crisis. Unfortunately, what we've done as economists and the CPR as individuals and researchers has fallen on deaf ears in some sense, in terms of the politicians. And I think that's where the World Bank and the IMF should play a greater role, because I think uh, uh, you have much more clout, uh, perhaps, in terms of influencing policymakers, politicians, than research articles or, or statements by economists. But there's a lot of research art out there that you can actually incorporate. So uh, basically what I'm saying is that vaccines and other containment measures are not just down risks in, in a forecast. They're key economic variables. Uh, so for instance, if we think that we can wait for a whole year in terms of vaccinating the population and we take care of those in high risk, we forget about mutations. Uh, what we've seen with the uh, uh, British mutation, the South African, now there's a Californian is, is that 
the more people get infected, the more likely it is we have mutations. And some of these mutations uh, could be resistant to the vaccine, could affect younger populations, different kinds of populations have different health consequences. We cannot afford uh, 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 to be too optimistic about these things and we have to act uh, as soon as we can. And by the time we get the vaccines out, we should not uh, take the foot off the pedal of trying to do more contact tracing, more rapid tasting to contain uh, contain the, the virus while we are rolling out the vaccines. And I think the fact that vaccines are out there, uh, I think there's some kind of uh, taking your foot off some of these other measures that are uh, needed. Uh, I agree with the uh, conclusions presented before that we should expedite vaccine production and we should, and this should be not just for saving lives, this is a huge economic variable here, the vaccine. Uh, just as a comparison, looking at the scenarios that were shown before uh, and just comparing the cost in, in, in some crude way, uh, if we think about uh, what it would take to buy out uh, Pfizer in terms of uh, all kinds of constraints that might be on extend, expanding the production of vaccine in, in emerging markets and so forth, uh, so just to put it in, in, in some economic terms, the entire market cap of Pfizer is 200 billion and, and the vaccine is probably uh, only a subset of that. The downside to world GDP of 2%, which we saw in this, uh, in this presentation is $1.6 trillion. So just for looking at the cost benefit here, there's a lot we, we could do uh, to expedite vaccine production and, 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 and something that Biden is trying to do in the, in the United States with the uh, requisitioning acts and so forth might go in this direction, but this would not just be in the United States. We should do this globally because this is a global crisis. Okay, so moving on to my second uh, uh, and, and kind of more minor comments uh, is, is uh, and I think here I'm in, in some agreement with uh, uh, Jeremy, uh, the previous discussant, is uh, looking at the financial costs, the asset purchases, the debt overhang, and, and I'll, I'll talk briefly about the advanced economies and the EMDEs, uh, the emerging markets and developing economies. So I think for the advanced economies, uh, we should look more carefully at Japan. Now, when the global financial crisis started uh, almost a day, more than a decade ago, uh, people already pointed out uh, that we should look at Japan. And I think most of us, uh, including myself, the company included, uh, dismissed that in some way. Uh, but I think as time goes on, interest rate environment is close to zero. Inflation is not picking up. Uh, we should take another look at, uh, at Japan, look more carefully in terms of a case study that, uh, and, and in this figure that I've taken from the uh, Fred, from the St. Louis Fred uh, economic synopsis, synopsis uh, uh, report uh, from uh, the end of last year. Uh, so what we see here, I mean, they, that was before the COVID and uh, before the things we're seeing right now, and this little short note looked at the Japanese central bank asset purchasing and, 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 and Nathan, that's the, yeah. The slide, we, we are still stuck on your first slide. Oh, you're stuck on my first slide because yeah. they're moving, um, they're moving on my uh, thing. I'm sorry, uh, do you see the slides now? Yeah. Small. Still the first slide. So it's still the first, the, still the first slide. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know what now that yes. Now yes. Now we see kind of half and half. Okay. So let me. Uh, Sorry for this. Let me share. Try and share again, and uh, because I have, I see everything working on my my side, and uh, uh, let me share again this thing. So we're just seeing uh, the small slides now. Yes. The first one. The first one. Okay. Sorry for this. Now we're kind of half of it, so we can see half of the big one and half of the small. 
Okay, so I, I see what the problem is. I'll just fix it in a second. Uh, so now you're seeing uh, the first the slide? The first one and the, all the small ones on the side. On the side, right. But for some reason, uh, I, I would suggest that you are making such good good points and in such yeah. great flow that you maybe maybe don't worry about the slides and and, and yeah, just, yeah, keep, so I'll, and just I'll keep just, going. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll try again. Uh, can you see them now? Yes. So you see the slides moving now? Yes. Okay. So uh, so you can all see the slides later. I'll just breeze through them. So you're seeing them moving now? Yeah, yes. Okay, so so I'm so here I'm, I, I think this figure you see the figure on the Bank of Japan now the asset purchases. Yes. yes. Okay. So okay. So we're right on, on the page, and the and you can look at the other slides that are on. So basically, th what this figure shows is the fact that the uh, uh, Bank of Japan asset purchases are as percent of GDP. Uh, that's before COVID are really high, and 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 again the sky did not fall over Japan, and I think that's. Uh, uh, something to look at if we want to look at some prospects of what's going to happen in the advanced economy. And again, I haven't researched it myself, but uh, there's some partial research by the Fed. But this is something uh, one might want to look at in terms of, of the forecast. Moving on to, to the uh, emerging markets and developing economies. Uh, so, so far, and I think this, uh, this view didn't change much from our previous uh, meeting in, 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 in June, is the fact that uh, in the short run, it seems like if you're looking, for instance, exchange rates or any other variable you would pick up, then if you look just at the short run, so we had this uh, depreciation at the beginning of the crisis, and then with all the stabilization efforts of the, and the liquidity injections of the Fed and so forth, so exchange rates kind of uh, declined back to sort of almost pre, pre-COVID uh, levels. And in that sense, uh, if we're, I'm, I'm, I'm taking Jeremy's point of view, I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic in some sense about what's happening in the emerging and developing economies. However, and this is something, uh, just, to, just some thoughts, uh, last thoughts, uh, if we zoom out uh, from the COVID crisis and look more long term, so what I've shown here are two figures. Uh, one of them is the, the exchange rate. So this is the emerging markets uh, uh, trade weighted exchange rates divided by the DXY, which is the advanced economies exchange rate. This, so this is a ratio of the emerging to develop. And what we see since uh, roughly 2013, since uh, tapering started after uh, uh, after the GFC, what we've seen is is sort of a long term trend of depreciation uh, in the EM currencies versus the DXYs, and and actually what's happening in COVID is is some kind of a reversal, almost uh, goes almost against uh, this long term trend, which is something to think about. The same way, if you look at the performance of the MCI, MSCI uh, Emerging Markets Index, uh, this is a ratio of the Emerging Market and MSCI divided by the SP500 with uh, 2008 as 100. That's before the GFC. What we see is, again, that after 2013, 2012, there's an underperformance of the emerging market stocks, stock prices relative to the advanced economies. And what we see towards the end in the COVID crisis is actually, uh, well, it's, it's just, we were just at the beginning there, but it, it seems like a reversal. So in that sense, there is some kind of uh, uh, a disjoint between the more pessimistic outlook and say comparing what happened to Argentina and so forth in 89 uh, and what markets, and I think Jeremy was representing the market view are thinking. So the question is here, is it, are we looking at some reversal or are we, or is it, or is it a bubble? And so I'll leave you with these thoughts and thank you again. Thank you very much, Nathan and, uh, and Jeremy. So we have uh, many questions already and, and please, if you have questions, uh, use the, the Q and A. Before getting to, and I will group them, the 
according to teams. But uh, before that, I just want to see if um, if I and Francisca had a, a quick reaction to the to the discussion of Nathan and uh, and Jeremy. Uh, thank you, uh, Hugo, and thank you, Jeremy uh, and Nathan. It's always a pleasure to exchange views, and uh, I think uh, we are broadly uh, in the same space. Um, just to touch on certain points raised by. Um, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy mentioned uh, how, in a sense, our growth forecast compared with uh, the consensus. The uh, big challenge there in this environment we have, uh, it's really important we focus on scenarios rather than point estimates. There is considerable uncertainty when we think about growth prospects. That's why uh, we provided these scenarios. And I think that the, the, this our upper bound, uh, somewhat similar to the current consensus, uh, is in a sense uh, right, uh, Jeremy's observation. Uh, the, the question is that whether that consensus is overly uh, optimistic. Um, two point on that one. Uh, of course, we released our forecast, and then there is this possibility of uh, very large, uh, around $1.9 trillion uh, US uh, fiscal stimulus on the table. If that happens, uh, uh, that's really a sizable amount of you know, uh, new boost to, to economic activity, close to 9% of the US uh, GDP uh, that will have a huge impact on the US growth for this year. And of course, there are significant spillovers associated with that for the global economy, as Jeremy uh, noted. Um, when we released our forecast in June, uh, we were below consensus. Again, uh, it, uh, we just focus on this point estimates. Uh, obviously, when you look at uh, what happened 2020, uh, in the aggregate, yes, uh, growth numbers uh, look better, still terrible. Uh, but uh, we downgraded our forecast for the majority of uh, countries. So um, I think that uh, going forward, we really need to be uh, mindful of the evolution of the disease and, and the trajectory of infections and the ability of uh, vaccinations. And finally, uh, let me make one technical point here. Uh, we use uh, market exchange rate based weights, uh, uh, not the PPP weights uh, like the IMF and some other uh, organizations do when we aggregate uh, growth numbers into global growth. And that of course makes a difference. Our numbers might uh, seem uh, lower uh, but there is this issue of waiting uh, and, and that, 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 that uh, affects you know, how these numbers computed. If you look at our PPP uh, weighted number, uh, that number is uh, closer to the kind of the, the, the other numbers. Uh, and you will see that actually every time when we release this report. Uh, so I think uh, there is reason to be optimistic for this year. But that optimism should uh, come with uh, caution and should have, uh, should have some bounds as well, given uh, what happened uh, over the past six months. I think uh, in June, uh, people thought that, you know what? Yes, there is a wave on the way, but uh, there won't be another one. So what happened is that there is another one, even more forceful than the first one. Now we are hoping that this vaccine distribution will go forward uh, uh, in a smooth, uh, you know, uh, speedy fashion, but there are hiccups there. The hope is that these things will be rectified and we will see better outcomes. The second issue is that whether this public debt problem is a big problem or not, uh, it depends on what types of countries we are looking at. Uh, obviously for emerging market developed economies, there is no question. There is a very serious debt challenge. For advanced economies, they are able to issue debt in their own currency. The challenge is not there. And, and they are able to accommodate 
and they have done so far. For emerging market developed economies, the story is different. And for especially low-income countries, we are seeing serious stress points. And uh, these stress points are uh, in multiple regions and in many countries. So that's why global community has the debt suspension initiative. And now they have a common framework established to treat uh, these unsustainable debt situations. And let's make sure we you know, uh, understand that these very low interest rates mask uh, solvency problems and, and basically postpone them. Uh, in 2018, we had very low interest rates. A number of countries had serious uh, stress in their financial markets. Uh, one of them had an IMF agreement and that agreement got derailed, Argentina. So I think that the, the, the low interest rate is not a panacea to solve the underlying debt problems in these countries. They should uh, accommodate as much as possible. They should, of course, uh, implement uh, fiscal expansionary policies, but they need to have a well-defined plan going forward and, and to be mindful of the consequences of unsustainable debt. The third issue is that growth and level effects. There is a negative level effect. I think that's uh, very clear. Every global recession brought that level effect. When you have a very sharp collapse in the global economy, you don't go back to pre-global recession trend level. That's what happened in 91. That's not what happened in 2009. And this time, if I have an even deeper uh, global recession, it's going to happen again in all likelihood, unless there is a productivity, of course, revolution. Now, in terms of growth, uh, let's make sure we basically have a good uh, a digestion of the history here. I think uh, in 2010, we thought that uh, emerging developing economies could generate growth 10 years ahead, around 6%. Now, that number is slightly below 4%. So it's not just uh, people are becoming increasingly pessimistic for, you know, out of no reason. Because uh, growth remained weak, investment remained weak, foreign direct investment uh, has gotten weaker, underlying drivers of growth uh, were you know, getting weaker. This was prior to the pandemic. And with the pandemic, uh, there is this very significant adverse impact on investment, physical and as well as human capital. And we will see how the productivity implications are going to play out, but in all likelihood, it's going to be difficult to return the, you know, the types of productivity growth rates we saw in the 90s, early 2000s. I also agree what Nathan said with respect to you know, the need to think about general recruitment effects, uh, combine the health policy and economic policy, uh, vaccination programs should be you know, uh, accompanied with the mitigation measures. We shouldn't drop the ball when it comes to mitigation. Uh, in terms of the uh, QE policies, there, I think uh, the point the report makes about the implications of these types of policies in the context of emerging market economies. Uh, in the case of advanced economies, I think policy frameworks are well-defined. There are credible institutions to employ these types of policies. And in many cases, uh, when we see advanced economies employing these types of policies, they also have reserve currencies. In the case of emerging markets, I think the, as much as central banks are in a much better shape today in terms of their independence, in terms of monetary policy frameworks, the history of asset purchase programs suggests that they are quite open to abuse. And uh, it could be, you know, a resort for the government to finance uh, deficits as uh, they were in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And if that happens going forward in an environment of weak growth, uh, it won't just affect, of course, uh, sustainability of fiscal balances. It will also affect central banks' independence and the central bank's policymaking ability. And we should be mindful of those risks
And then uh, financial markets and the real economy, I think we can discuss this issue. Uh, we, we would like to see more data to be convinced that there is real, basically, uh, uh, the, the growth coming back in a sustainable way, not just because of this unprecedented fiscal and monetary policy support. I think uh, we will have a much better idea in the second half of this year how the you know the the growth dynamics going to play out. Sooner or later, some governments will think about, of course, uh, relaxing some of these policies, and then we will have a much better idea how this tragic health crisis and deep economic crisis affected, for example, the corporate sector. We have uh, limited information on that one. We need to see the kind of the, the end of very lax macro prudential policy. But uh, let me stop there, uh, Ugo, and it's back to you. Thank you, Ian. So we have many questions. Some of them you, you already partly addressed them, but let me uh, start by grouping some of the question in three groups. And, and then, uh, so there is one by uh, Nicola Nest, with my, my former colleague at ANCTAD, which uh, asks exactly about what you were talking about is what's the intermingle between you know leverage in the in the public sector and leverage in the corporate sector so how do you see uh, this problem possibly resulting in, in financial turmoil it's related to what you were talking about uh, right now and also related to that there is a question by uh, Jérôme Talandier which I assume is asking besides the growth paradigm if there is another way to thread that issue. So I guess the, the question is whether besides economic growth, there is other way to get out of that. Then uh, we have two questions, uh, one by uh, Daniela Tolenghi and one by Sergio Martinez, which is basically, it's related uh, probably by the last slide of uh, Francisca, which is about policies and policy trade-offs, some, you know, some policies are might be conflicting, how we deal with them, how we prioritize policies. Um, and then there is a, there is a question by um, uh, your former IMF colleague, Shweta Saxena, my friend and co-author also, who is basically asking, you know, countries that need uh, fiscal stimulus the, the most are, are those who have a less fiscal space. And uh, so how do we deal with this uh, challenge? So maybe let's try to start with these three uh, blocks of question and then let's see where we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, these are all uh, very good questions. With respect to corporate debt, uh, I think the kind of the, the challenge is um, the, the impact on the corporate sector uh, uh, has to be seen. I think that there is just a, a plethora of policies to protect the corporate uh, sector, the kind of the, the firms, and, and these policies are, of course, the, uh, necessary. Uh, in an environment, uh, you have this type of deep uh, recession. The, the, the moratoria of debt, uh, forbearance measures, uh, relaxed uh, credit policies. The question is, you know, how much the kind of the balance sheets of these uh, entities uh, were affected and whether uh, they will be able to operate when we go back to uh, somewhat, you know, more normal uh, macro prudential uh, policy implementation. And that has to be seen. And there uh, we, we think that even prior to the crisis, uh, there was a very serious corporate debt problem. In some countries, this corporate debt was in uh, foreign currency uh, in emerging market and developed economies. Uh, we need to see the kind of the, 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 the extent of the damage and whether there is resilience in, in corporate sector to be able to respond to that damage. Uh, solutions for that is, is critical. Uh, you need growth. Uh, when you have growth, uh, you can basically uh, uh, address the debt problem, but that growth has to be sustained for a period of time to reduce the kind of the debt levels. Policies uh, can make a big difference. Uh, the debt management is critical, uh, especially nowadays. But increasingly, what we learn uh, is the kind of the creditor base expands. Uh, 
that transparency is becoming more and more important, uh, especially to understand that dynamics in emerging markets and developing economies and uh, some of them, of course, uh, low-income countries. In some cases, uh, there is need, of course, to, uh, to, to go back to fiscal rules. They were relaxed uh, in the case of emerging market developing economies. And uh, it always boils down to good governance, effective regulation, and supervision, ultimately, if you would like to address the fiscal challenges in a medium term. Now, let me make one point. Uh, global community has to act to address the growing debt challenges in low-income countries. So far, as I already mentioned, there is the debt, sub, uh, debt suspension initiative. Uh, we will discuss, uh, you know, the basic future of that initiative in coming weeks and months. There is also the common framework put in place. The question is whether these solutions are going to provide durable outcomes. Obviously, the suspension initiative is a temporary fix, but in the case of common framework, we need to make sure it is implemented in a way that will lead to durable debt reductions and, and uh, uh, growth that will help not just you know, the kind of the, the short-term cyclical dynamics, but the long-term dynamics. So these low-income countries can uh, attain the type of development outcomes they need. Now, uh, there are policies and policy trade-offs, and then the, the issue of you know, the kind of the fiscal space. Let me turn to Francisca to answer these questions. But uh, greatly appreciate the questions, and I'm happy that uh, colleagues, the old colleagues from different parts of the world uh, joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great to hear familiar names. Um, so on the policy trade-offs, that's a difficult question, but uh, not all is lost, even if governments don't have the money for big public investment. And we deliberately illustrate that with a whole number of examples in our chapter. There are things that emerging market developing economies can do to improve access or to improve social outcomes that don't need to cost much money or at least don't need to cost more money. So take, for example, digital services. In a lot of African countries, whatever broadband there is cannot be accessed because it's so expensive. So what is needed, even if you cannot invest in more broadband, what is needed is a, a strong regulator, a strong regulator that can increase competition and can bring these prices down so more people can access. So it, it goes back into this governance reform that is needed in a lot of countries. Or take, for example, infrastructure investment in water and sanitation. Our colleagues in that, that part of the bank estimate that the overall life cycle cost of water and sanitation investment projects could be halved if there was just maintenance. So instead of spending money on building the next water plant, Repair the old one. You so prioritize expenditures such that it's efficiently used. The money is most efficiently used. So there are things that countries can do, even if they're severely constrained in, a, in, in their spending envelopes. Um, but it becomes, it's very hard to see big themes in this. That's the catch with these recommendations. It's very difficult to see a global theme that you can recommend because it's very, very country specific then. So it really gets into the feet on the ground, uh, individual country circumstances that need to be examined. I want to add one more thing on, on the debt. The interaction between public and private debt is a fascinating topic. We looked at that actually in our previous study where we estimated the probability of a financial crisis depending on these rapid accumulation debt episodes. And the probability of a crisis is much higher when it's both public and private debt rapidly accumulating. And in all likelihood, this is what has happened in 2020 again. We know what's happened in 2010 to 2019. Probably got only worse in 2020. And there was one more question on debt. How much of the debt increases because of increased market access? Like Ihan said, the number of creditors has expanded dramatically over since, for example, the HIPAA initiative for low-income countries. And when we looked at these four waves of debt, we noticed that every one of these wave of debt was begun, started, was initiated with some financial market innovation. 
could have been a new instrument like the bonds in the 1990s, the bond markets in the 1990s, or syndicated loan markets in the, in the 1970s, could have been a new sort of, sort of actor, like these mega banks that developed in the early 2000s. And this time around, there has also been a whole number of new actors entering these financial, financial these debt markets, basically access to debt for lower income countries. So yeah, that's part of the story, makes debt resolution much more difficult, of course. Back to Ugo. Okay, so there is, uh, we have four minutes. So there is a question that I found fascinating. It's something I, I never thought about it. So, but uh, this is from Fiona Hopkinson. And, and she basically asked, might we see supply constraints if country looks to coordinate a fiscal stimulus, especially uh, given that COVID is limiting supply a little bit. So I, I actually, I never thought about it. I, I thought it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating question. Uh, you know, we always thought that this coordination is good and, and it's like, so maybe there is, <laughs> uh, they will uh, strain the system. And, and then um, something that I had mentioned, but maybe this is like really, hung, I don't know, several trillion dollar question is, is this sort of uh, disconnect between uh, you know, uh, any forecast on the real economy and what we see in asset prices. So I, I am briefly mentioned this before. It's all fiscal. It's all the uh, monetary policy stimulus is something else. So uh, maybe we could use the last three or four minutes for these two questions. Did you want to question on asset prices at all? Or, I mean, how do you want to handle that? Or do you want to just leave that for IN and for Shishio, seeing we don't have much time left? Maybe if we do quickly, if uh, if um, if IN and Francisca can say something quickly, and then if we go two minutes beyond limit, I think it's fine. Uh, thanks, to, uh, thanks to Hugo. So in the context of supply constraints, my hope is that Let's you know see, and let's hope there are supply constraints, and and that will basically trigger uh, different types of dynamics we have not seen over the past uh, decade, and maybe even bring back inflation. Who knows? Uh, so uh, so the the this uh, if there is uh, I think a strong and durable recovery supported by fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, there is this, you know, the possibility of uh, supply constraints emerging, even that these supply constraints are triggering uh, inflation. Uh, there is quite a bit of chatter in uh, among financial market participants. Uh, uh, we thought that uh, we were getting somewhere in terms of inflation uh, when uh, Fed started increasing interest rates, you know, three years ago. But we know how that ended uh, uh, in early 2020, even before the pandemic. So I think uh, the, the, we need to see more data and then uh, the kind of the, the, uh, make a call. But uh, output gap is quite sizable. The damage is there. Uh, so it's going to take time to, to see the kind of a huge uh, change and it comes to supply. But my hope, it, hopefully that it happens. Let me stop. Uh, Jeremy, you want to say something quickly about asset prices? Yeah, uh, so my, my point would be that um, some of the concern about asset prices is overdone, right? It, it's overdone in the sense of, uh, say, an equity market. An equity market is an infinite discounting mechanism, right? It's, you know, the idea that the growth rate of assets in a particular year should be perfectly correlated with the growth rate of the economy in a particular year is just not a great, way, great framework for capital asset pricing. And so the way I'd sort of think about it is you have a much larger, right? So you have a near-term shock to economic output that may have some permanent effects, um, but, right, but the effect on permanent income is smaller than the effect on current income, right? And so the, and particularly because of the nature of this shock, right, which was you had a very short period of pure economic contraction and then the rebound has started quite quickly. It allows the market to look through that more. On top of that, you have had 
very significant amounts of policy support. I think that there has been a structural decline in long-term interest rates. We'll see how long that is sustained for. But it's in addition to just what we might think of as equilibrium, real and nominal policy rates, also term premium in bonds have come down as well. And so that can have an effect on your equilibrium asset prices as well. And so my point would be that when we look at, say, the when we look at asset prices on a long-term basis, then we have lowered our long-term outlook for returns, but that doesn't mean that what we're saying is that the level of asset prices is wrong. It's just that you've had an adjustment and then you should expect future returns to be more moderate. But the idea that we're on the cusp of some crash in asset prices because of a major imbalance, I don't think that is, I don't think that is right. Um, and actually, one of the things that might make it right would actually be if there is a failure of policymakers to sustain the effort to get economies back, you know, to close output gaps. I mean, I just can't emphasize this enough, right? Is this, this framework that in a sense that support provided by monetary policy and fiscal policy isn't real, it's what's sort of happening in the underlying economy. Well, no, because if you make policy errors, if policy isn't accommodative enough for long enough with the right composition complemented by reforms, well, that's when the growth doesn't appear in the future. And then that's when the validation of market pricing wouldn't occur and where the risks would ultimately come from. So these things are actually ultimately connected to each other. What, the pol what, what markets are not pricing in is a major policy error. If there was a major policy error and policy support was withdrawn too quickly, particularly in the major advanced economies, well, then I think all bets are off. Thank you, Jeremy. We're a bit over time, but I wanted to give the microphone for a minute to Francisca, and uh, then I guess we can close. Francisca? Thank you. I think the questions have been answered greatly by I having Jeremy already. Nothing to add. Nothing to add. Okay, good. If anybody wants to add something? No, I guess then we close it here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Francisca. Thanks, uh, Beatrice, uh, Jeremy, and, uh, and Nathan. And now we look forward to the next chat. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Jeremy, Nathan. Thank you, uh, you Beatrice. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.